I'm Dr. Esser from the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I am so pleased to introduce you to two people who are passionate about equine nutrition in this third equine health series seminar. So starting off will be Dr. Christine Skelly. She received her doctorate at Texas A&M University studying equine nutrition and exercise physiology. In 1995, Dr. Skelly joined Michigan State University as the equine extension specialist in the Department of Animal Science. Dr. Skelly instructs courses in equine nutrition and management and works with industry stakeholders, including Michigan Horse Council. Dr. Skelly is a founder of and director of the My Horse University, which is an online equine education program and provides leadership for the 4-H, Michigan 4-H Proud Equestrian Program, which supports therapeutic riding programs for youth in the Michigan 4-H program. Tyler Cappert is an equine nutrition specialist for Tribute Equine Nutrition and works with horse owners to develop specialized feeding programs for their horses. Tyler graduated from Michigan State University and is an avid horse owner. He currently shows reining horses and owns a small boarding facility in Michigan. So with that, I uh, turn the screen over to you, Dr. Skelly. All right, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, we, this is actually pretty exciting for me because I'm pretty sure this is the first presentation I have done uh, with a former student of mine. So <laughs> Tyler took my uh, equine nutrition class uh, several years ago, and it's really, really exciting to uh, be with him uh, today. And um, he was an exceptional student, and he's an exceptional equine nutritionist now. So I'm going to start off our uh, talk talking about forage. And I think Tyler and I would all agree that um, forage is really the base for your horse's diet. And it's pretty easy to get caught up in, you know, what, what type of concentrate or supplement you might be choosing for your horse. But first and foremost, we really need to focus on what we're going to feed our horses from a forage standpoint. And so uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about matching the forage to the horse. Um, we'll also talk about uh, forage species and how that might affect quality of the forage. Um, we'll talk about uh, grazing management, uh, some hay selection tips, and we'll end with water requirements because, you know, we can feed horses all day, but if they don't have water, uh, we're not going to go any place with them. So uh, just to uh, just to get us started thinking about uh, thinking about nutrition, thinking about the different nutrients. Um, you know, obviously water's extremely important. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but what usually, when you mention nutrition, what usually comes to at least horse owners uh, forefront is, oh, that's vitamins and minerals and protein in my horse's diet. And that is true. And they're all extremely important. Um, but there's also energy. Uh, energy is really important, and that's usually how we uh, how we start developing um, uh, our diets is around the horse's energy needs. Uh, and there's another component, um, and I don't know if every nutritionist is going to talk about fiber as a nutrient, but I think from the horse's perspective, because they um, originated uh, grazing uh, 18 hours a day and the, the highest component of their uh, diet was fiber-based, right? Uh, grazing uh, the range and the forages that they could scavenge up uh, off the range. Um, so fiber is extremely important. So as we look at the needs of the horse, uh, we have horses out there that are that are really on the high end of uh, the their classification from a nutritional standpoint, and uh, one would be the lactating broodmare. Think about it. You know, she just she just birthed this foal. Now she's producing milk. Plus, she's got to get ready to go get rebred. Um, she has a, a really high uh, nutritional plane that she has to meet. Her energy needs, protein needs, uh, uh, vitamin and minerals are uh, are extremely important for her to uh, do her best job. 
And then we also have our, our high end of the performance horses. We have our race horses. We have inventors. Uh, we have Tyler down here on his uh, high end reining horse. Uh, all of those horses need uh, a lot of energy uh, to do their work. We've got to make sure that all the other uh, gaps are filled from vitamin mineral standpoint and that their protein uh, uh, is met in their diet. Then we have horses kind of on the low end of the spectrum. And here we have a little pasture pet um, just kind of existing, plenty fat enough, right? So uh, they don't need a whole lot more nutrition than what they're, they're getting off of that pasture. Um, maybe we're going to balance it out uh, with some uh, minerals. Uh, we have a, a donkey here that, you know, donkeys and ponies uh, are usually... Um, pretty easy keepers. So we usually were concerned with uh, them not getting too fat. We have a stallion over here on the other end, um, retired racehorse, not racing anymore. And uh, believe it or not, guys, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy to get even the job done in the breeding barn. But we definitely want to make sure that this horse is on a good nutritional plane so that uh, he has everything he needs for healthy sperm production. But this horse's energy needs aren't as big as they once were when he was actually racing. So we want to keep all of that in mind as we start thinking about what kind of forage uh, should these horses be fed. And so if we look at um, what they need from an energy standpoint, uh, we think about uh, energy sources on a dry matter intake. And that means that we just pull out all the moisture from the feed stuff. Uh, so now we're just looking at uh, uh, what's there without the water, okay? And if we're looking at feed stuff on a dry matter intake basis, then we say that if a horse is really, really working hard, uh, they need uh, about two and a half percent of their body weight per day in dry matter intake. So I do my simple nutrition math here and I bring out my thousand pound horse. And that means that that thousand pound horse needs about 25 pounds of dry matter intake uh, per day uh, to meet their energy needs. And you can see from this little chart that you're a really heavy working horse and your lactating broodmare and your growing horses all have a real high energy need uh, from a, a feed intake standpoint. And then we, it starts to get lower as we decrease the amount of exercise that that horse is performing. And all other classes would include uh, our really light working horses, uh, maybe some of our weekend warriors that we just get on, uh, play around with on, on Saturdays, uh, our pasture pets out there, some of our, um, our uh, older horses, uh, and then some of our, our ponies would be uh, in that uh, lower intake range. So if we know that, then we have to decide, so what is going to make up this dry matter intake? And uh, one thing I like to do when I'm working with 4-Hers uh, is I like to compare their fruit food plate to what their horse's food plate would be. So um, if we look at what USDA is recommending uh, uh, people to eat right now, uh, about half of our plate is filled up with vegetables and fruit. Uh, another quarter is filled up with grain. And then a smaller portion, a little less than a quarter is made up of protein and that can be meat, it can be fish. Um, could even be cheese. And then we are all drinking milk with every meal, maybe. <laughs> uh, but for a horse then, it looks a little different. So about three quarters of that horse's plate would in general be filled with forage if they were eating off of a plate. Um, another quarter of that might be uh, filled up with a concentrate made up of uh, either one grain or different types of grains. Um, and this could be in a, 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 a textured feed like we're showing you here, or it could be pelleted. It's pretty much all the same. Um, and that's if they need it on top of the forage to meet their energy needs. And then 
if we if we're uh, still in a little bit of need, maybe you're working with your veterinarian on something very specific, you may actually need to supplement on top of that. But usually if you have a high quality forage, if you have a, a concentrate that's been selected to specifically uh, meet your horse's uh, requirements, usually you don't need to supplement on top of uh, uh, those two uh, components of your ration. And then of course we uh, top it off with water. So if we're looking at um, uh, the food pyramid, kind of another different way of looking at uh, what we're gonna feed to our horses, uh, we still have forage as being the basis of that. And we can meet that forage need in a variety of forms. Uh, horses can uh, graze out on pasture. Uh, we can feed them uh, hay. Uh, we can feed them hay cubes if we don't have access to hay. Uh, we can feed them hay pellets. And sometimes hay pellets is a good choice if you have a horse uh, with a respiratory disease where they get really bothered with uh, uh, dust or mold spores. Uh, this associated uh, with, uh, with hay, uh, feeding them uh, their forage in a pelleted form might be a better, better way for them to take that in. Uh, but for all of this then, we start out again with our basic rule, horses can consume about two to 3% of their body weight per day of dry matter intake. So depending on your horse's needs, they may be on the lower end of that, or they may be on the higher end. Um, and then horses require at least 1.5% of their body weight in forage. That's at the very minimum. And what we want to try to do uh, to feed these horses a really healthy diet is to maximize our forage intake. So why are we, why are, why are we thinking forage? Um, and it's really important that horses have enough dietary fiber uh, in their diet. For one, uh, they utilize uh, um, forage to produce energy. So they don't really digest forage within the stomach or even the small intestine. Your forage keeps on going into the hindgut. So you have a big fermentation bat uh, of the cecum filled with microbes. And then you have the uh, continuing on through the um, coils of the large intestine. And uh, within this hindgut then you have a big microbial population uh, that's digesting uh, this fiber that can't really be digested in the foregut, has to be digested by the microbes in the hindgut. And they're uh, taking this fiber and they're turning it into volatile fatty acids that get used by the horse as energy. Um, so that's pretty impactful. Uh, for the horse um, and providing a lot of the energy that the horse needs in their diet. The other thing, uh, feeding uh, forage to horses, it also helps to prevent uh, impaction type colics. Um, just that uh, two inches of, uh, of forage fiber uh, passing through uh, the small intestine through the hindgut helps to stimulate uh, the intestine and keeps that gut healthy. Um, horses are hardwired to chew. Uh, again, back in the wild, they're grazing for 18 hours or so a day. Okay, so they're really hardwired to chew. It takes horses a lot longer to chew, uh, whether they're grazing grass or uh, chewing hay, than it would to uh, chew a five pound uh, uh, portion of a concentrate or grain. Uh, so the longer we can keep them chewing, the more saliva they're producing. And that has a direct relationship with gut health. So if we're looking at uh, the stomach, uh, that saliva is gonna help buffer our stu that, their stomach environment and will decrease the risk of these horses uh, getting stomach ulcers. Uh, so that's a really important uh, contribution that forage can make to the horse's diet. Um, also, if horses don't get to chew, 
they're going to find something else to choose, whether it's your uh, your fence, uh, your trees, uh, each other's tails. Uh, again, they're just really hardwired to chew. If they don't, if they can't chew anything, that's when we start to see undesirable behaviors like um, uh, cribbing or um, uh, potentially pacing in the stall. Uh, so all of those are really important. Um, if we're able to have horses outside uh, chewing uh, or grazing on pasture, you also get the uh, ben uh, benefit of them being able to convert uh, sunlight into vitamin D uh, in their bodies. Um, it's uh, being outside is better for their respiratory health, most likely than being in a stall. Um, you can reduce your bedding cost, which is a big win-win. Uh, and it's also really good for horses to be out and active uh, to develop stronger uh, bones, not just for our younger horses, but even our older horses can benefit from moving around rather than being in their stall. So, once we figure out how much uh, forage our horses need, then we need to think about, well, what type of forage do our horses need? And when I work with uh, horse owners, a lot of times they're not exactly sure uh, beyond grass hay uh, what uh, they're actually feeding their horses. So it's, it's important to know what species of forage your horse is primarily consuming because uh, there's a lot of difference then in the nutritional value between different species. So if we look at, uh, if, you're, if you're down south, uh, you're most likely feeding warm season grasses uh, like Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, uh, Teff grass, uh, would potentially be some uh, warm grasses you might feed in your area. Um, if you're up north, uh, you may be uh, feeding more uh, brown grass, orchard grass, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, even uh, tall fescue, Timothy is a real popular grass. Um, so these would be some cool season grasses that you might be familiar with. On average, your cool season grasses are going to be a little higher in, uh, in uh, energy than your um, warm season grasses. They're also going to be higher in uh, protein content than your warm season grasses. However, uh, one advantage warm season grasses have uh, from a standpoint of uh, some people in the horse industry is uh, they're usually going to be a little lower in your uh, starch and sugars. So if you're feeding one of these horses that has metabolic issues, you may be looking for uh, a, a forage variety uh, that is a little lower in uh, non-structural carbohydrates. Um, and warm season grasses would fit that bill a little bit better than our cool season grasses. And the next type of uh, forage that you can also feed beyond your grasses are your legumes. And when I think of legumes, the first uh, legume that comes to my mind is alfalfa. And that's probably the most popular legume that we have that's actually harvested and fed um, as hay. Um, and uh, beyond that, then we have our clovers. Sometimes you'll see clover introduced in a pasture mix. Anytime we have legumes in our pasture mix, uh, that will help with our soil fertility. They do a good job of fixing uh, nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, so you have a little bit of a healthier uh, pasture. Um, and, and a lot of people will use clover to get that job done. Um, in some areas, they may even uh, uh, harvest clover uh, and put up as hay. And, uh, and I had no idea there was such a thing as bird's foot trefoil until I came from Texas to uh, Michigan. And uh, in, uh, in uh, northern Michigan and the UP of Michigan, we have bird's foot trefoil. And that's a pretty cool uh, kind of a spreading type legume that goes across the pasture. A real hardy uh, plant that uh, does well in sandier, rockier soils. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there for everybody in Michigan. I'm not, not forgetting about bird's foot trefoil. 
uh, in my talk here. And so if we do a little bit of a comparison between our, our warm grasses, cool grasses, and legumes, uh, the legumes are going to be uh, higher in energy. So we look down here at our digestible energy and we're uh, measuring it in mcals, which is megacalories per uh, kilogram. Um, and then uh, we are also looking at crude protein and uh, legumes are much higher in, uh, in uh, protein uh, than our grass species. So um, that's, uh, that's why you'll see legumes, uh, alfalfa being fed to your lactating brood mares, to your real high performing horses, and to your young growing horses. That's a, a really nice forage uh, for horses that have really high nutritional requirements. However, you wouldn't necessarily want to feed that uh, to your pasture pet that kind of breathes, uh, uh, lives off of breathing air and still stays pretty fat. So uh, thinking about the, the different species of, uh, of forage that we can feed, we can also look at how we're going to feed it. So pasture is one way that we feed uh, forage. And uh, if you have a good, well-maintained pasture, it is really uh, a luxury um, to have. It can really reduce uh, your forage cost. Uh, for one thing. And if you have horses that have a really high plane of uh, nutrition, um, then it's a really great feed for those horses. So especially for horses that you're trying to put weight on, again, your lactating brood mares, your performance horses uh, do really well on a uh, good quality pasture. However, any horse that's on pasture, you really want to monitor their weight uh, because some horses can get really fat on pasture pretty quick. Um, especially ponies will get really, really heavy on, on pasture. Um, and if you overgraze your pasture, you can lose that nutritional value really, really quick. So you want to keep your stand of pasture about four inches high. And if it gets rainy or if the pasture gets too worn down, you want to take your horses off, give them hay in the meantime, and let that pasture uh, rest to prevent overgrazing. Now, if you're feeding horses on pasture, it's uh, while they may be getting uh, most of the vitamins that they need uh, from good quality pasture, what you won't be certain of is their uh, access to the minerals that they need. Uh, so all horses need electrolytes, uh, sodium chloride, um, especially when it gets uh, warmer outside or if they're exercising, their electrolyte uh, demand increases. But they also need what we call our trace minerals. And these are minerals that they need in very, very small quantities, but they're all extremely important. And since all soil kind of varies in this mineral content, like here in Michigan, we typically have low uh, selenium uh, in our soil. We need to ensure uh, that they have the op opportunity to get enough of these uh, trace minerals in their diet as well. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see uh, su supplements for specific areas in, uh, in Michigan. I might buy a pasture block that has additional selenium in it. Uh, to make sure that uh, my horse out in pasture uh, is getting uh, the benefits of, of those minerals. And when you are grazing in the spring, then you want to avoid uh, grazing horses um, in spring pasture that have a history of laminitis because the grass is just going to be too green. It's kind of like opening the candy store open uh, for these horses. They just love it so much. They eat it so fast and it's going to be too rich for them. Um, one thing that I always do uh, in the beginning of spring is I make sure that horses don't leave uh, the barn until they've had a uh, 
their hay, their morning hay. Uh, so you're kind of filling them up, hopefully to decrease the rate uh, that they're uh, eating that new pasture. But you wanna definitely practice more of a gradual turnout program when you're first introducing horses from uh, a stabled hay environment into a spring pasture. You want to uh, start them out for about 15 minutes of grazing time, bring them back up. Doesn't sound like a long time, but these horses can really eat a lot in 15 minutes. Uh, and then each week you wanna just increase that interval uh, by another 15 minutes. By the time you stretch that out over uh, six to eight weeks, your early spring grasses are, are pretty much gone and you can feel pretty comfortable keeping your horses out on pasture at that point. If you have horses that uh, you need to restrict their grazing because they get too heavy um, or maybe they've had some past issues with uh, laminitis, you can use a grazing muzzle with them. Um, you could uh, potentially just put them in what I call a sacrifice lot that doesn't have any uh, grazing available in it, but then you have a, a, a hay rack out for them, or you just have to limit turnout. But all horses can really benefit from being outside and being able to move around. So I would always prefer the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sacrifice lot. So real quick on evaluating hay then, when you're, if you know what kind of hay you need for your horse and you go someplace to look at it, uh, you, want, you can do some visual appraisal of that hay. And first you can look at softness of the hay. And that's really gonna tell you uh, how mature that hay is. So if you're looking at grass hay and it feels real soft in your hands, that's probably a pretty uh, immature hay. If it feels real stimmy, stimmy and thick and coarse, and if you see a lot of seed heads uh, in that hay, then that means that it's uh, a more mature hay and you're not gonna get as much of a nutritional value from your mature hay. If you uh, then look at leafiness, you can look at leafiness in your grass hay, but also in your, um, in your alfalfa hay. Uh, so when you're, when you're uh, looking at leaves then, uh, they should be uh, fresh and they should stay on the stem. Okay, if, if alfalfa gets too dried out, a lot of times you have a lot of leaf shattering um, and the leaf is really the nutritional value of your alfalfa hay. So you wanna be really careful also when you're handling alfalfa hay. You don't wanna throw it around the way we do our grass hay. Um, you wanna check for odor and Basically, you're checking for moldy hay and you're also checking for really dusty hay. Neither one of these hays is, is good for horses. It can actually, if you have a horse, an older horse especially, could actually potentially lead to that horse getting uh, respiratory uh, problems like heaves. Uh, so you wanna uh, stay away from moldy or really dusty hay for any horse really. And then you also wanna look at hay for cleanliness. You wanna check it. I, I had a call uh, last year, a person had a bunch of fiberglass uh, that was harvested in with their hay. Um, and you know that I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's not gonna be good for, for a horse. Um, it, but beyond uh, mud and manure and you know bugs, uh, you also want to look for uh, uh, weeds. And weeds can be a problem like Coriolisium uh, in the Midwest is a problem. Uh, it looks a little different than it does uh, out in the wild or in the hay fields once it's dried, but you will see this little branching out of the little nodules and you'll see the dried up little white flowers with the Coriolisium. Probably the last thing you really look at when you're evaluating hay is the color of the hay. But for a lot of horse people, that may be the only thing they look at. Um, and you have to be careful about letting that really dictate what hay you purchase because color is going to vary with the species uh, of, the, uh, of the forage, uh, but it's also going to vary with um, uh, how long it's been up in storage. Um, as well as if there's been any light or sunlight uh, hitting it will uh, 
uh, dull out the color of hay. Um, so hay would, or the color of the hay would probably be the last thing I would look at. And so in general, as, uh, as um, uh, hay gets more mature, then the uh, digestible energy of the hay is going to decrease. As hay is more mature or left out in the field before it's harvested for a longer period of time, uh, the crude, crude protein level of the hay is uh, gonna end up being lower. Um, so uh, a really uh, mature hay isn't gonna give you the nutritional value of a immature, mid-mature type hay. The only way we can really know the true value though of our hay is to get it tested and to get it tested in a forage lab. Um, and uh, usually though, you don't see this done unless people are putting up their own hay and they just wanna know the nutritional value of their hay or maybe they have young horses with uh, uh, some um, uh, bone developmental problems, uh, or they have horses that are at risk for uh, insulin resistance. Um, then they're really concerned with their starch and their, uh, uh, their uh, fructans and their hay. Um, but that's really the only way you know for sure. And if you're gonna spend the money getting a forage analysis done, get a good representative sample of your um, hay that you've put up. So the only way to really do that is to use a core sampler. And not everybody's gonna have a core sampler. Um, you, may, uh, you may be able to work with uh, somebody that's putting up a lot of hay that has a hay probe. Uh, your county extension office may loan you a hay probe to use. Uh, we do uh, typically here in Michigan. Um, somebody at your land grant university may be able to loan you a hay probe, but that's gonna be the best way to uh, get a good representative sample. And most of these forage labs will have good directions for how to take that, um, that sample. A couple of other things before uh, we let this go. Um, I get questions when we've had really uh, wet harvest uh, periods about hay, uh, hay preservatives. And hay preservatives, usually you're looking at buffered propionic acid uh, for hay. That's when you've had to harvest hay and it's still a little wetter than you'd like. You put a preservative on it to prevent mold from forming. Um, I would rather feed a hay with a preservative on it than feed a moldy hay. Um, so it's safe for horses. A lot of times horses will be a little snotty initially about actually eating it, uh, but over time they will. So um, that, that is okay to do. If you are feeding hay, the big, big thing that you need to know is as soon as we harvest that hay, the vitamins start rapidly decreasing. So I don't even include vitamins in the picture when I'm formulating a, a ration with hay. I, I look at hay as having no vitamins at all. At all. Even though it started with uh, some really great uh, vitamins in it when it was out on pasture, as soon as we store it for 30, 60 days, uh, you can pretty much not count on your hay to bring anything to the table from a vitamin standpoint. And that's where uh, your ration balancers, some people call them forage balancers, are just really a godsend to the horse industry. Um, so the purpose of a, of a ration balancer is to balance out the forage in your diet. This is great if you have a horse that you don't necessarily want to give grain to. Maybe they're one of those easy keepers, but you want to ensure that all of their, um, all of their nutrition is being met on a day-to-day -day basis. So usually a ration balancer is going to have real complementary vitamins and minerals in it. It may have a protein source as well. And a lot of people get really scared when they see 28% protein on a ration balancer. But remember, you're going to feed this in a very small quantity. So that all gets diluted out. So you're not overfeeding protein. The other great thing about ration balancers is they're going to be really low in sugar and starch. And they're, again, fed in really small quantities. So great for a horse that has to be on a diet. 
Um, in general, then uh, we've kind of talked, I think Tyler is actually going to talk a little bit more about um, about body congestion scores, or we can talk about that more during the Q and A. Um, from a water standpoint, just to end, um, all horses need about 10 to 12 gallons of water per day um, on, on just a regular day. Those requirements may double if you have a mare that's producing milk for a baby, or if you have a horse that's uh, uh, being exercised in really hot weather. Um, so make sure your horse has plenty of access to clean, fresh water. If horses become dehydrated, they have a much greater risk of having impaction colic. So you wanna make sure that horses are given a fresh water, a free choice, and at a comfortable temperature. So you, if you live where it gets really, really cold, uh, and especially if you have older horses with sensitive teeth, you want to make sure uh, that that water is kept warm enough to where they can, they will drink it um, and drink enough of it to prevent dehydration. And with that, I see Tyler is up and ready to go. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Tyler. And now you just have to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that might help. It's not a Zoom presentation without issues like that. Uh, just give me one second to get my PowerPoint up. I, Chris, I think I'm going to have to turn your screen sharing off. And then mine should pop up. Chris, uh, while we're getting this switched around, would you like me to announce our next uh, winner for our giveaways? Yep, now's a good time for that. All right, very good. So our next winner for our giveaways this evening is Phyllis from Michigan. So Phyllis, you are our second winner this evening and uh, thank you for joining. And Tyler, I'll hand it back to you. Great, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. So tonight we're gonna talk on my segment a little bit more about concentrates and grains that we could be feeding to kind of help balance our forage. Um, a couple things we're going to talk about to help you kind of navigate all the different options on the market out there for grains. So we have things like fixed formulations, um, a balanced amino acid profile, organic trace minerals, pre, and, pre and probiotics and digestive enzymes and gut health um, factors in gr grain. And then we also have some formulations with GC, like GC plus, which is glucosamine chondroitin and MSM. And then next we're going to talk and highlight a little bit more about sugars and starches. So that would be NSC. So NSC stands for non-structured carbohydrates and that's the sugars and starches. So when we talk about sugars and starches, um, there's a lot of different things we need to consider like individual variation. So every horse is kind of different, just like people. Some people gain weight easier than others or lose weight. Um, some people have really good metabolisms so just like that, people, horses are very individual. So we kind of have to focus on the individual horse when we're trying to navigate our horse's nutrition program. Um, how much feed stuff are we feeding? The NFC content of what we're feeding and the rate of what they're eating um, and further processing of what we're feeding. So that could be like rolled oats or pelleted feeds, things like that. So the different, um, processing can affect digestion. So in terms of NSC, if you guys are familiar with corn, um, corn is about 75% sugar and starch. Your average sweet feed is gonna be right around that 40% sugar and starch. Um, Turbid has some products that are 12 and a half percent sugar and starch. So when we're talking about NSC intake, um, say you're feeding like a ration balancer, if that ration balancer is maybe a little bit higher in sugar and starch than you would like to be feeding, consider the amount you're feeding. So like Dr. Skelly said, with ration balancers, balancers, you're feeding a really small amount. So if it's like 12 and a half percent NSC and your horse is only eating one pound of that, then that's still a really low NSC intake. Hey, Tyler, um, can I get you to pause for just a minute? Um, we're yeah. having some people, quite a few there, saying they're, they're not seeing the 
PowerPoint presentation. Can oh, okay. we just get you to stop sharing for just a minute and reshare? I'm seeing it just yeah. fine, but since we've got about four people that have said they are not seeing it, let's just try to yeah. stop and reshare. And so you should see an option at the top of your screen to stop share your PowerPoint. Did that stop it? Uh, nope, we're still seeing it. There we go. And then um, so we're out of the presentation view. So just click, um, do you see stop share at the top? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. And let's just try and share it one more time and see if that fixes it for some folks. Sorry to make you stop, but sometimes Zoom uh, forces us to take a break and give something away, right? So um, let's give away our, our next uh, gift here for this evening. So our third winner for, for tonight is James. James from Michigan, you are our third winner. Okay. So Tyler, I see your PowerPoint. Let's go back into the PowerPoint view. And there we go. It looks great to me. So I'm going to let you uh, keep going here. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thanks for stopping us there. Should I go back any and? Um, maybe just, yeah, start. This slide is fine, I think. Perfect. So this is the last slide we left off at. Um, so talking about corn, it's 75% sugar and starch. The next one. Um, so let's kind of apply this to a horse's diet. So say there's a product that they are feeding, or the product contains 28% NFC and 6% crude fat. This horse is in moderate training. So per that feed tag, they're saying you need to feed a minimum of 11 pounds of grain a day. So let's take a minute to kind of talk about feeding rates. So your feed is formulated um, to be fed at that certain rate on the feed tape. So at that rate that they're saying to feed the feed, it's got all the extra vitamins, minerals, everything that horse is getting that's not in the forage um, at that rate. So it's really important to be feeding at that correct rate. Say your horse is an easy keeper and you just give them like a handful of this or a handful of that. Um, maybe look at a ration balancer because that'll really help get all the vitamins and minerals in that small amount without giving a lot of energy. Um, so this competitor product in moderate training, they're saying they need to feed it at 11 pounds a day. That's 3.08 pounds of just sugar and starch. Take a product like Calm Ultra, so that's 23% NIC, so a little bit lower, but double the fat. So it's a 12% crude fat. The source is in the same moderate training, and this product has a little bit lower feeding rate at seven pounds a day. Um, so with it being a little bit lower NIC and a little bit lower feeding rate, this horse is now at 1.6 pounds a day of NIC, so a really big drop and consumption of that NSC. So higher fat feeds typically have a lower feeding rate because there's a little more calories in that fat um, and that higher fat will drop the NSC intake. And a really good example of that, so to give you guys a visual, so this is about three and a half pounds of a product called Senior Sport. Um, this is a three quart grain scoop and I have this plastic bag. So this is a one gallon plastic bag. A horse's stomach on average is like one to two pounds, two gallons. Um, so we're gonna dump this grain in that bag. Get it all in there, make a mess. But this is three and a half pounds. So see if this is a one, gallon stomach, that stomach is full of this concentrate, which is really not good for your horse's gut health. So whenever you can feed, if you can feed more times per day, that's really good. Or if you can feed less at a time, um, so a lower feeding rate, that's really gonna make a big difference. Your horse can only, only utilize so much. So when you can drop that feeding rate, they're able to utilize and not stress the horse's gut out that much.
All right, next we're gonna talk about formulation. So we know the horse's gut thrives on consistency. Uh, when you have a product that is fixed formulated, it means those ingredients will never change on that take. There's uh, another term out there that some competitor products use called least cost formulation. And least cost formulation, you're always gonna have the same guaranteed analysis, but the ingredients and the source of like the protein and fiber and all that kind of stuff could vary. So a tag on the right, um, it's tribute, calm and easy. So it's listing and full transparency, the exact ingredients that are in that feed. So it's beet pulp, soybean hulls, wheat mids, uh, extruded soybeans. And then we have a tag like on the left that is least cost formulated. So they're only listing, um, so ingredients is grain products, plant protein product, products, processed grain byproducts. And in those collective terms, it could be any of these. So maybe they have separate manufacturing plants um, where products are more available or there's less trucking expenses. Um, so in those different batches, they can all vary a little bit, which is changing the ingredients and that formulation of that tag. And we know that's not good for the gut. So when I'm picking a feed for my horses, I really try to find something that is fixed formulated. So at least the grain is consistent every bag. A balanced amino acid profile. So on the feed tag, you might see like 14% crude protein. So amino acids are proteins. Uh, but it's important to note the horse doesn't necessarily absorb crude protein. It absorbs the amino acids that make up the crude protein. So some common amino acids that are limiting in forages, um, lysine, methionine, threonine, those kinds of stuff. Um, and we really want to focus on protein quality, not just the percent. And this next slide is going to show us why we don't want to focus just on the percent. So we have a barrel on the right and a barrel on the left. The barrel on the right is going to be very balanced um, to demonstrate. It's going to be very balanced, a uh, balanced amino acid profile. So we have this lighter purple part of the barrel. And our goal is to fill the barrel up as full as we can. So we have plenty of lysine in this horse's diet around this barrel. And then over here we have maybe a little bit less methionine. So the goal is to fill up that barrel, but since the horse is getting enough lysine but not methionine, the horse can only uh, utilize so much of that lysine. So we need to have a balanced, and if the horse isn't getting a balanced diet, then it can't absorb everything. So it's just gonna eat it, and then it's gonna end up on the bottom of the stall or in the pasture. So this is a really good example of why you really want a balanced amino acid profile. If you guys have any questions on this, uh, leave a comment in the chat and we will answer that later. All right, organic trace minerals. So it's not like the non-GMO, all healthy organic um, term we're referring to. Organic trace minerals just mean it's bound to a carbon containing molecule. So what's that do? It uh, improves absorption for better hoof and coat quality, better immune support, better oxidization status, and especially with those growing horses, um, it improves bone metabolism. So it really helps reduce the risk of developmental orthopedic disease. We're starting to hear, even with people, um, more about pre and probiotics for gut health. So prebiotics are, is the food for the gut bugs and probiotics are the actual gut bugs themselves. Um, with our products, we had a heat treated or encapsulated pre and probiotic. So it reaches the hind gut where it's more beneficial for the horse. It needs to go past the horse's stomach acid so it can be better utilized in the hind gut. So this is just to kind of give you a visual of a more balanced diet. We have the horse on the left, it's a little bit sun faded, but um, body condition wise, it's not horrible. It's definitely got some good rib coverage, um, 
decent muscling on the hind end, but now we have this, it's like a Frisian perch on cross. Just look at the difference in the health of the hair coat. It's not sun faded, it's really nice and shiny. It's a little bit more coverage in the rib, a little better top line, just a lot more muscling in the hind end really makes a big difference. So when that horse is getting a balanced diet, it's able to absorb and utilize everything that horse is getting much more efficiently. Here's another good before and after. Um, so again, fiber is super, super important forage. Uh, we have the horse on the left that we are assuming is just not getting enough uh, forage, but then it's not getting anything else like a ration balancer. Um, so once we balance the horse's diet, a lot more shine to the horse's coat, a lot nicer top line, a little bit better muscling and some really nice rib coverage. So this is probably one of my favorite before and after transformations. This horse on the top uh, actually came to my boarding farm uh, from another boarding facility. And you can kind of just see the horse is really underweight, faded, um, hair coat, not really good muscling, poor top line. Um, and then I think that was maybe five months later, this horse is almost overweight now. So it's a six-year-old, 17-1 anti thoroughbred. Um, so 17-1 is a pretty big, he's a pretty big guy. So he's got a lot of bone to cover. Um, so we added some protein with our essential K, our ration balancer, and then a little bit of fat with our senior sport really helped fill up the rib cage, add to the top line and just promote overall bloom. And then last one before we bring a horse out, um, the horse up here, it really doesn't look too bad. I mean, decent top line, decent muscling, uh, but now take it, look at the after photo. Uh, really nice top line, just look at that hind end, really nice carry down in the muscling, uh, nice gaskin a lot of muscle over the rib cage, a little bit better skin coat, hair coat, just a really nice looking buckskin. Perfect, so that wrapped up, up my PowerPoint and we're gonna just take a look at one horse here. Um, can we just confirm that the PowerPoint went away? Yes, the PowerPoint Perfect. has gone away, so we just see you. Perfect. And while, while Tyler pulls out his horse, my name is Carrie Althaus. Um, I'm also a sales rep for Tribute. And uh, one thing I did wanna emphasize, you know, we kind of all work together as a team in Michigan. There's lots of different sales reps um, and we're all happy to come out to your farm. It doesn't matter if you have one horse or group of horses, we're happy to come out and body score. Um, look at your current feeding program and make any recommendations um, and also help you with those, those hay samplings as well. We do uh, core analysis. Um, if you guys ever need us to. All right. If we get a good angle here, Zoom's a little bit new to body scoring for us. So the first thing we look at when we body score is we look for any signs of fat deposits. So if they've been fed a high sugar starch diet in the past, um, and generally we can see those fat deposits. The first one, we go down the crest of their neck, and about three quarters of the way down, about a quarter up from their withers, it would feel almost like membrane foam. So it would be really firm going down their neck and then you'd get a real soft spot. Um, most ponies, minis will have one. That's normally the most common fat deposit. We can oftentimes see one here behind the shoulder and then also over that tail head. And the reason we look for this is just, you know, again, we're looking at that, that hay as well as the grain and just trying to decide if we need to go towards a lower sugar starch grain in order to, to help um, reduce any issues with metabolic or any insulin resistant issues. The next thing we'll look at is over the rib cage. And, you know, as Dr. Skelly mentioned, obviously horses, you know, the, the best thing in their diet is hay. And ideally we would like them to live off of hay. And in some cases like this horse, we can do that. Um, however, our hay lacks some of those key nutrients. So this horse, for example, maintains his weight pretty well just off of the forage. So an ideal body condition would be a five where you can't visibly see those ribs and you don't have to push too hard to feel them. 
If they were able to see ribs, we'd put them at a four, a little thin. And if we really had to push, we'd put them at a six. But he's just about a perfect five over those rib cage. Um, and then the last thing we look at is this top one. And this is the, the biggest thing with our ration balancer, Essential K that Tyler was talking about. Um, again, it's high in protein and high in amino acids. So when we feed that, we can get a lot of muscle coverage over this back. A lot of times customers will call us and they say their horse is so thin. And sometimes they look okay here over the rib cage, but they're lacking that muscle. And it just makes their overall appearance look really thin. So this is calories. And then this is protein and amino acids to fill that muscle in. So for this horse, for example, it's a perfect five over the rib cage. Top line looks good and he's maintaining off of his hay. However, we're still lacking the copper, the zinc, the selenium, all those nutrients Dr. Skelly mentioned. So in this case, he's just getting um, our ration balancer, Essential K, and it can be fed just at one pound a day. And it's giving him all of those nutrients the pro and prebiotics that Tyler mentioned, organic minerals, omega-3, omega-6s. So he's getting all that good stuff in just a pound a day. If we needed to produce more top line, we could feed up to, to two to three pounds to really promote a lot of muscle. So he's a pretty easy keeper. All right, and I think we can, um, at this point, hand it back to, to Q&A um, and again, Feel free to reach out anytime. I'll make sure that Tyler gets our contact info to you guys because we are happy to help in any way that we can. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, should we do a, a drawing? Do we have a, is this a good time for, you bet. for another one? We love giving stuff away. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so our uh, our next winner for this evening is Beverly from Maine. So Beverly, you are our next winner. Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, great. Well, we've got a few questions in the Q&A box that, um, that we'll throw out there. Um, so this question could probably go for either of you, but it's addressing the hay probe. The question is, is it worth getting a hay probe to do only visual inspection? And this is in a scenario that would be to check a large truckload of hay at delivery time at a barn with about 100 horses. Yeah, so... Um... It's uh, if you are feeding horses uh, with a pretty high intensity of workload. So let's say you know you've got some uh, pretty good uh, uh, eventers or dressage horses or race horses, or maybe your clientele has an expectation that you're feeding a high quality hay, but every once in a while you need to prove it. A uh, having that um, hay analysis on that on your hay that you're feeding your clients horses uh, could be um, a real uh, plus for you. I think uh, those hay probes cost uh, you know between a hundred and two hundred dollars depending on how much you're going to pay for it. But a lot of times you can get access to those hay probes from uh, somebody else. So yeah, if I were if I had a uh, I'm assuming a hundred horses are going to be uh, primarily client horses. So I'm thinking that wouldn't be a bad idea um, for sure. If you have young growing horses and you have any incidents of any uh, developmental orthopedic disease on the farm, you would definitely want to uh, analyze your hay or if um, there's any other issues, uh, a high rate of metabolic issues on the farm, that would be another good rationale for, um, for getting uh, your hay analyzed. Tyler, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, if you're just doing a visual kind of score of the hay, then you probably wouldn't need a hay probe itself. You can just kind of look at the hay and go through some flakes or the round bale, whatever you're feeding and kind of get a visual analysis. The only reason you'd wanna really probe the hay is to send it in for a lab test. Very good. I've got another question here. 
how do pellets compare nutritionally or otherwise with hay or alfalfa that's in bales? Yeah, so if I have the choice, I'm always gonna feed long stem forage if I can. Um, and that's one thing pellets won't give you. Uh, pound per pound, uh, they're gonna be they're gonna be the same from a nutritional standpoint of uh, the ingredients. Uh, uh, pelleted hay is just uh, hay that's uh, been pulverized and put through a dye uh, in the form of pellets. But you're losing that long uh, that long stemmy forage that really helps your gut. It's also uh, horses will consume them a lot faster, so you're losing that time spent chewing that's really healthy for the horse's gut as well as for their mind. Uh, but uh, I always tell people if you have a hay shortage where you have to use uh, some other feed stuff like uh, hay pellets or hay cubes or even going to a complete feed, I tell people to try to stretch that long stem forage along with it. Uh, so don't let your long stem forage totally get to zero before you start adding in your pelleted. Try to stretch it with your with your hay pellets. But you can feed those pound per pound. Tyler, you have any any I more ideas on the uh, pellet versus long stem? No, I think you've nailed everything that I would have talked about. I, I, I do like uh, hay cubes, you know, unless you have horses that are prone to choke, I think uh, hay cubes uh, might even be a better alternative than the pellets because they do give you some uh, long fiber uh, for the horse, it takes a little longer to chew. Yeah, and just from a mental standpoint for those horses, I mean, they're made to graze and chew, chew so when you're feeding that long stem forage, it's definitely the way, the, the way to go so they can do that. Yeah. Another question here. Um, the ration balancer that I've been feeding lists soy as a first ingredient. There are different views on soy as a horse feed. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Tyler? yeah I'll start with that. Um, so with ration balancers, just keep in mind, it's a really low feeding rate. Um, and soybeans are a really good protein or amino acid source. So that's why it's typically one of the first ingredients in a lot of those ration balancers. Um, so it's really effective and it's a really, really low feeding rate. Um, Tribute does make a ration balancer. It's called Wholesome Blends Balancer and that's a soy-free product line. Um, so there is an option for soy-free out there um, I don't know if there is anything about soy. And there's really not a whole lot of research out there, I guess, at this point um, on soy, you know, whether it does, you know, affect negatively or positively, but it is just hard to come up with a good protein source without the soy. But yeah, we did just come out with Wholesome Blends Balancer and we actually use linseed meal and canola um, to get that protein level. So we do have a, a good option for that now too. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And, and I've heard a little bit about that uh, through the grapevine. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, soybean meal has always been kind of the uh, go-to uh, from a uh, protein source for horses when we're trying to up the ante in our, in our diets from a protein, not just protein quantity, but protein quality, because soybean meal is really high in lysine and some of the other amino acids that are important for a, a really good quality protein protein profile for our horses. Alfalfa meal is something else you might also see in feed to um, increase uh, the protein. And alfalfa hay actually has a good uh, lysine content as well. Um, so if I had a horse that uh, was having some sort of allergic reaction uh, or really loose stools or something just chronically, and I had, I was working with a veterinarian and we couldn't make heads or tails out of anything else. Then yeah, I, I may try a product that is soy free, right? Just to check off uh, my, my box of things I'm gonna look at, right? But uh, you know, if you think of all the years we've used soybean meal and horses diets with really good results, um, there, 
while there might be some certain cases that it could potentially be a problem, uh, just for the population, if your horse is doing good on it, I wouldn't take it out of your diet. Great, thank you. We're getting lots of great questions here. Um, what are your thoughts on wetting down hay? Yeah, so um, that's right, I did forage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you would wanna wet down hay maybe in two different cases. Um, if you have a horse that um, is having problems with dust in their hay, uh, you can wet that hay down um, and actually feed it pretty well to uh, horses maybe with mild respiratory distress. Um, also, uh, you can, you can uh, soak hay uh, to try to leach out some of the uh, sugar and starch that we talked about, uh, some of the non-structural carbohydrates uh, in that hay. And, you know, there's been papers that suggest you can, you know, uh, leach out, you know, up to 40% of those uh, sugars out of your hay by soaking it for at least an hour or so. Anytime you wet hay though, you wanna feed it immediately because if you leave it out and it's wet and the horses take their time eating it, you could run the risk of it getting moldy. So that's kind of my thoughts initially on soaking or wetting hay. What, um, do you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree. I don't see any problem with soaking it or wetting it. I always just kind of mention with customers that if your hay is moldy, um, you're adding water, it's not rinsing the mold off, your horse is still ingesting that mold. Right. So if your hay is moldy and you're wetting it to kind of help alleviate that issue, your horse is still ingesting the mold. So it's Yeah, if your hay is moldy, it's the wrong hay to feed your horse. <laughs> And I, I, I've done that before. We've, you know, we, I remember one winter we put up, um, it wasn't, we didn't harvest it, but it was our, it was a really bad year for Michigan hay. And we ended up with a barn full of really average to low quality hay, a lot dustier than it normally uh, would be for our area. Not necessarily moldy, although I think I did throw out a few bales because of mold. And I guarantee you our horses that winter, when they came out in the spring, they looked terrible the worst they've ever looked. And it was because of uh, just a big difference uh, in their forage that year. They picked up really quick on pasture, but um, I was a little embarrassed <laughs> once they lost their hair coat. <laughs> Great, thank you. Another question here, what would you recommend feeding an older horse with Cushing's that has dental issues. So meaning several, uh, missing several teeth and has a hard time eating and that has recently foundered. And I know what I'd feed them, but I'm gonna let Tyler take this question because I think they may have something in particular in mind that would work great. Yeah, what comes to my mind first is a product, a senior feed or seniority would be our product. That's a senior feed. So that's a low fat, but really high fiber feed. So it's only a 6% fat. So it's not super high in energy and calories, but there's a lot of fiber to keep that old senior horse, you know, the digestive tract working so they can eat that fiber and everything um, without putting a ton of calories in that horse's diet. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, and then it's also really, really low in sugar and starch. So it's gonna be a good way to get the high fiber in, replace that forage that maybe we're dropping and then keep the sugar and starch low for the cushions. Yeah, the, the senior feeds have really revolutionized our horse industry. And that's why we see, you know, horses living into their late 20s, 30s, um, and the ability to take that feed, you can uh, soak it, make a little slurry with it. And these horses, even without hardly any teeth at all, they can just lip it up and uh, get a, a really uh, great benefit from uh, the nutrition in that. So it's really changed our industry, I think. Yeah, growing up, we had a horse who lived to 42 years old. Um, it had no teeth for probably the last like 12 years of its life. Um, and it was on a senior feed its entire last part of its yeah. couple, 10 or 12 years. And it did really well. We were riding it all the time. It was the kid's horse that we put all the beginners on. 
Yeah. And, and, and those feeds, those complete feeds, because you can feed senior feed like a complete feed. The one thing you have to remember if you're not feeding hay is read the directions and feed the amount they're recommending. Uh, because you don't feed a complete feed the same way you would a normal concentrate. concentrate. You're going to have to feed a lot more of it because that includes the, for the forage portion of their ration. So that's, that's one mistake that sometimes you might see people make is they're just kind of scared of so much feed going into that bucket. But for an older horse, especially if you can feed it, you know, uh, a lot of small meals during the day, that's going to be really helpful. Yeah, we see a lot of customers too that switch to a senior feed based on the horse's age and not based on their teeth. So that's another example of that. We really don't recommend a senior product unless they need that hay replacement or the extra fiber. Yeah, as soon as you see horses start dropping feed a lot and leaving quids with a lot of um, uh, uh, saliva on them. And, you know, once they start, you know, you may have a horse that has typically been a real easy keeper and all of a sudden they're just starting to drop weight. And these older horses, they can drop weight really quick and it's pretty hard to put it back on them. So you want to catch them before they're really into a free fall on that. And that's, that's, that's when they start showing those signs that might be when you want to consider uh, switching them over. I, I totally agree. Some horses have to get on it maybe in their late teens while other horses, you know, way into their 20s uh, yeah. before it's time to get on. So it's, it's like us, you know, we all age a little differently. And I'm sure Dr. Uh, Rapson and uh, Dr. Esther may have, may chime in there as our veterinarians here. <laughs> I mean, I would just say I do agree with what you're saying. Um, I absolutely do. I think that it's really important to feed for the horse and not feed for their age, right? Feed for what the horse needs and look at their teeth. Um, perfect. Should we ask another question? Um, uh, maybe um, one more question and then we'll have our final uh Final giveaway, what do you say, since we're getting really close to the, to the uh, pumpkin hour here? Okay, um, I think this should be quick. How do you recommend spacing out the forage during the day if the horse does not go out to pasture? And this is a 1,000 pound horse. Yeah, and, and I haven't necessarily uh, used these myself, but I've had, I've seen some clients and friends use them and our, our slow net hay feeders actually work really, really well for uh, slowing down uh, the way horses eat. Uh, so that would probably be my first recommendation if a horse has to be in a stall uh, to put, oh, and here we go. Thank you, Tyler. I, say, I use these and I love these. So this was filled this morning and there's been a horse in here all day. Um, so it only slows them down a little bit. It just kind of extends that amount of time that the horse has hay in front of them so they can pick at it throughout the day. Um, I mean, it's super easy to fill and then just latches. So it's super easy and it just really helps kind of extend that grazing period and that stall, I guess, or make the hay last longer. And they don't waste the hay as much, I think, yeah. with those slow feeders. And you can tell this horse is a pretty easy keeper, so he does pretty yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gwen. We've got a few more questions here, and I will. Uh, we will work on some of these questions and post uh, some answers uh, on our Facebook page as well, the My Horse University Facebook page. And I'll give these uh, questions uh, to CVM, and you guys can post it on your uh, Equine Health. Uh, Facebook page. All right. Well, and I think that's the last of our series. <laughs> so hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make this happen again next year. I think it was uh, a lot of fun working with my colleagues over at the vet school, working with industry professionals uh, like Tyler and um, uh, 
and uh, tribute. So um, it's really, really nice uh, seeing everybody over Zoom. <laughs> and even if you guys have your face-to-face -face meetings, maybe we could still do a few more webinars together next year. Well, thanks for joining. That's, uh, we really appreciate everybody's time and thank you to the audience members that are out there listening uh, and watching, much appreciated.